I wanted to welcome you to today's webinar, a part of IFAI's series of scaling up trainings discussing agricultural production tools and economic forecast models to help build strong tribal food businesses and food systems throughout Indian country. In recognition of National Food Safety Education Month, this month's Scaling Up webinar will discuss general food safety practices for your operation or food business. Specifically, this training will feature foodborne illness prevention practices, how to structure a small scale food business to limit individual liability and develop a food safety plan for your operation. Before we get started, I wanted to go over some housekeeping. All attendees will be muted during the presentation. However, you can use the control panel to submit questions using the questions dialog box. We will have time to set aside for questions at the end of this presentation. As a quick note, we will also post this webinar recording on our Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative YouTube channel and follow up with an email that includes the webinar recording and the PowerPoint presentation. I will be your presenter today. My name is Blake Jackson. I am the staff attorney and a policy officer at the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative. I've been here for about a year and I am a certified uh, PSA, Produce Safety Alliance Food Safety Trainer under the Food Safety Modernization Act. And I am also uh, the one who has been doing the majority of these scaling up trainings and given uh, some of the overview of these tools that we've had for producers. Uh, so without further ado, I will get going into establishing food safety practices today. Uh, before going into a little bit of our uh, uh, material, I wanted to give a little overview of our organization if you haven't been with us before. Uh, we are the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative. Uh, we are in the University of Arkansas at the Office of Economic Development. Uh, formerly, we were in the School of Law under uh, uh, Dean Stacy Leeds, who is now the Vice Chancellor of Economic Development, along with our founding director, Janie Sims Hip. Uh, Janie has since moved on to other lines of work, uh, but Stacy has now become the Vice Chancellor of Economic Development and has moved up from being the Law School Dean. So with that transition, we have moved with Vice Chancellor Needs to the Office of Economic Development uh, in July of 2018. And that, that space really uh, it allows us to exercise our mission more fully of enhancing the health and wellness in tribal communities by advancing healthy food systems, diversified economic development, and cultural traditions in Indian country. And if we really wanted to hone in a little bit more on our work, we like to think of our work as putting the tribal sovereignty in food sovereignty. Uh, we, we hear the, the language of, of, of food sovereignty a lot uh, in, in more modern discussions about the supply chain and, and where our food is coming from and locally sourced. But we, we all know throughout Indian country that tribal sovereignty has a unique meaning and we, want, we don't want that to get lost in this, in this discussion. And we help kind of facilitate that by providing strategic legal analysis, policy research, and economic resources to empower Indian country through food sovereignty, agriculture, and economic development. Uh, a few precursory comments for today's uh, presentation. Um, it's, it's important to know that those that often engage in food don't have a working knowledge of general food safety liability principles. So this webinar is meant to provide a broad and general background and discussion on the legal issues related to food safety, and specifically dealing with Indian country. Understanding food safety liability issues will assist you in understanding the issues unique to Indian country. Uh, we have a lot of jurisdictional things to consider because we all know that tribes uh, also have the ability to make uh, their own laws and be governed by them, and that is to the exclusion of state law, uh, except in a few a few scenarios. Uh, so, so given that uh, that kind of context, it's important to know that within this larger regulatory scheme, that tribes have a unique space to occupy going forward. Uh, so, food safety liability: what is it, and what does it encompass? Uh, it really normally is divided into different types of hazards. Um, you can see that it doesn't just include the foodborne illnesses, but it includes other things. Uh, it's a more encompassing term. When you talk about our food system, you have biological hazards, which are bacteria, mold, and naturally occurring toxins. We also have chemical hazards and physical hazards, which we won't get into today, um, but just know that this does deal with herbicides, pesticides, heavy metals, petroleum products, and others. M chemicals that are used uh, in a way that's inconsistent with their intended purpose, or maybe in, in a way that's not consistent with their approved uh, labeling instructions that might wind up uh, to be an unsafe amount in food to present a food safety issue. We also see physical hazards, uh, mainly just particulate debris in food, uh, glass, rocks, wood, splinters, bugs, et cetera, uh, that might wind up you know, from, from that debris coming off of something in a packing house or the assembly uh, of, a, of a food product of some sort on, on those uh, facilities. 
but we won't get into those, but it's important to know that this, this does deal with more than just biological hazards going forward. And so it's important to know what, what the illness sources are. And these are most simply put microorganisms, uh, bacteria, parasites, va viruses, yeasts, molds, uh, E. coli, salmonella, listeria, just to name a few, norovirus, uh, rotavirus, and hepatitis A, uh, very contagious. Uh, and we also see different different parasites, uh, cryptosporidium, parvum, uh, giardia, lambia, cyclospora, both parasites that can be uh, biological issues. And these are these are things, guys, that you have to look under a microscope to see. They're, they're too big to be seen, or too small to be seen with, with the naked eye. You have to have uh, special equipment to see these. But just because they're small does not mean that they will not have an impact on the end consumer. Um, they don't recognize jurisdictional boundaries like you and I. Uh, you know, when we go a across the boundary of another tribe or another state, we know that we're under a different regulatory scheme. These little these little creatures don't do that. So it's important to know that these these are always going to be an issue regardless of what jurisdiction you're in. Um, they don't recognize organic versus non-organic, the type of farm. So these are things that are just innate in dealing with food uh, the food system. And 90% of the foodborne illnesses come from four bacteria. Campylobacter, Salmonella, Clostridium, and Staphylococcus aureus, which is basically staph, uh, if, if you've heard of people having staph infection. Um, and the way that these, th these kind of break into different ones and they have different sources to them. Uh, Campylobacter is often present in raw and uncooked poultry, unpasteurized milk, and contaminated water. Uh, e. coli uh, is in undercooked ground beef, unpasteurized milk, soft cheeses, raw fruits and vegetables, contaminated water, juice, fecal matter of infected people, animals, uh, listeria, the soil and water in some animals, poultry and cattle, uh, raw milk and foods from raw milk, uh, processing plants, ready to eat deli meats and hot dogs, meat spreads, soft cheeses, raw sprouts, and some refrigerated and smoked seafood. Uh, salmonella, we hear a lot about contaminated eggs, poultry, meat, unpasteurized milk or juice, cheese, contaminated raw fruits and vegetables, and, and animals in their environments, and, and these uh, other uh, types of exotic uh, animals that it can come from. Uh, we have shigella, contaminated food or water, salads, uh, raw vegetables contaminated in the field and sandwiches. Botulism uh, is one that you hear about sometimes uh, concerning uh, canned food uh, is one that, that comes from a lot of processed food properly, uh, and properly stored food, basically. Uh, Clostridium perfingens, uh, it's one of the most common causes, causes of food, food, uh, excuse me, food poisoning and properly served or refrigerated cooked food. Uh, of those natures. And hepatitis A, we're all familiar with, uh, primarily through uh, food or water contaminated by the stool of an infected person. So someone not washing their hands after using the restroom would be an example there. Raw or undercooked shellfish, contaminated water or foods not reheated properly. Norovirus, uh, very contagious. Produce, shellfish, ready to eat foods touched by infected food workers or from vomit or feces from infected persons. The most common cause of quote unquote stomach flu. Um, you see this a lot in, in food establishments, uh, and there has to be a specific kind of cleaning done because that can that can spread like wildfire. Um, Staphylococcus, uh, most commonly found on the skin and hair in the noses of throats of people and animals, present in up to 25% of healthy people, so you may be a, a carrier of this and not even know it and be healthy. Food handler contaminates food and food not properly refrigerated. Salads, bakery products, sandwiches, milk and dairy products, meat, poultry, eggs. Vibrio uh, usually occur naturally in warm coastal areas found in the higher concentrations of summer months, can be life-threatening, and you can get it from raw and uncooked shellfish. But just the thing to know is that microorganisms are everywhere. Some are harmless and some are beneficial. Um, some can benefit uh, your growing environment. Some can uh, are present in your gastrointestinal tract. Um, Everyone has E. coli in their intestinal tract. Uh, that's that's there's good bacteria and there's bad bacteria. It's that uh, that that bad bacteria strain that you've got to worry about. Um, food handlers, animal feed, animal hides, dust, uh, 
each of each of these things guys do have some sort of microorganism present whether it be benign to your system it might be beneficial to your system or parasitic or or, or harmful to you so just just knowing that there are different classes of, of microorganisms out there that can affect you um, the microorganisms in food um, kind of are along those harmful lines are the ones we'll talk about and the pathogenic kind that can cause illness um, spoilage can cause foods to smell, taste, or look unacceptable. Food becomes inedible, changes to color, flavor, odor, appearance. Uh, high enough levels can cause the food to break down, and different foods have different spoilage levels. Some don't do anything to foods, and some are naturally occurring, as I said. And some even amount to fermentation, which is used to control microorganisms in food and can produce the desired food product. Uh, to give you an example here, guys, uh, E. coli has been, we've seen a lot of outbreaks through the years. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the Jack in the Box hamburgers back in 93 that really kind of brought a lot of mainstream media on this issue and kind of understood uh, kind of that the food was being undercooked at Jack in the Box at the time. And that caused a larger issue uh, for a, a lot of those. Uh, ch it was a lot of children infected by this, um, resulting in 100 ill and four deaths. Uh, there was a dull baby spinach outbreak in 2006, along with a Taco Bell fast food outbreak that resulted in about 275 uh, illnesses and three deaths between the two of those. And the thing that we're more familiar with is the Chipotle Mexican Grill fast food uh, with the with the E. coli from the lettuce that came there and resulted in 55 uh, illnesses. Uh, salmonella is another one that we've seen uh, throughout this kind of compressed timeline. Um, the PCA peanut butter incident, uh, Cargill ground turkey, Foster Farms chicken. As you can tell, it's more in the in the poultry side of things, but that doesn't exempt uh, other foods because we saw the largest outbreak of this recently with Mexican cucumbers in 2015, causing only one death but leaving uh, 907 ill from the outbreak. Uh, listeria uh, is another one. Uh, this one kind of goes back a little bit further in, in its history that we've seen. Uh, Jalisco products uh, cheese causing 28 deaths and 142 illnesses. Uh, a hot dog outbreak in 98-99 causing 100 illnesses and 14 deaths. Uh, Pilgrim's Pride turkey meat causing 46 illnesses and 7 deaths. And then cantaloupes actually having a listeria infection uh, causing 147 illnesses and 33 deaths. Botulism uh, is another one. Uh, we don't see as many outbreaks in here, but again, it kind of goes back to the can the canned and uh, processed contained foods. Um, kind of going again to the outbreak in 2015 of being home canned potatoes. Um, this is an article uh, that was put out by a dietitian uh, named Julia uh, Haston. Uh, she's also an MD. Um, talking about the different kinds of most common pathogens associated with foodborne illness outbreaks, just to give you an idea. Um, you see basically the three largest causes being animals uh, and plants. Uh, well, some of the other different, there's there's the other things that kind of come into play in the production line, but the largest uh, contributor that we see, uh, and we see more of a risk profile being uh, being harder to contain is, the, is that with plants, because leafy greens often don't have a kill step before you consume them so it's harder to kill those microorganisms so we've seen uh, some legislation enacted called the food safety modernization act that really has moved food safety regulation onto the farm and uh, has caused a lot of uh, a lot of different uh, regulation to take place kind of on further up the, the distribution chain to where certain growing practices have to be obeyed uh, in order to keep that food uh, safe and minimize that risk profile but going forward, as you can see, the one that has resulted in the most deaths uh, from 2009 to 2015 is listeria. Um, we've seen a lot of hospitalizations uh, due to salmonella, but the one that has been the most outbreaks and the most illnesses uh, here is the 46 and 45 of the norovirus being the percentages of, of what the result is there. Those, those numbers represent a percentage of the whole. So... Like I said, norovirus is very contagious and it can cause a lot of sickness, but you see different uh, illness profiles accompanying uh, different types of bacteria here. Uh, again, this is a little bit of a dated information, but it also shows you the top hazards in produce. Again, going back to that, um, to that 
leafy greens having kind of that certain risk profile and produce having that certain risk profile because it's not often cooked before consumed. Norovirus and salmonella being the two largest contributors to, to outbreaks and pathogens uh, in produce. So now that we've kind of addressed um, these issues and how they can impact your operation and the consumers of your food, it's important to address how to controlling these for how to control these for food safety. Um, looking at your ingredients, uh, making sure the specifica specifications and control of ingredients and food products are mentioned. Um, overseeing quality, physical, and microbial contamination levels and guarantees, and having uh, certificates of the analysis of the ingredients so you know what's being put in those foods that can cause certain risks for food safety to be increased in certain instances. Um, processing, adequate processing to control or destroy microorganisms, uh, cooling so that the bacteria don't have the right temperatures to grow, uh, pasteurizing so that those bacteria are reduced um, and making those commercially shelf stable um, if through a canning process or something, uh, adequate packaging systems to produ pr protect products, packaging must be of a good sanitary and food grade quality that ma to maintain seals or let prob so that problems uh, don't get let in. Um, because if something is airtight, it's not going to have that environment for something like a loose-fitting lid for organisms to get in and grow. And after processing, controls in the distribution chain for tracking and recalling foods, having a lot system and a food safety plan in place in case there is an outbreak, and consumer information uh, necessary for safe consumption, so having the right ingredients labeled in case there is maybe an allergen issue, and on-farm, uh, compliance through the Food Safety Modernization Act is required now for growers over the $25,000 uh, production limit in a given year. Um, so it's kind of important to know that farm to fork food safety quality is is something that is kind of looking at. And there's there's a wide variety of laws that apply to this. A uh, HACCP is one. Uh, hazard analysis and critical control point to make it to where you have to identify where certain pieces of uh, contamination can occur in your food production line uh, for, the covered, uh, for the covered food product. And that turns into uh, finding ways to mitigate those risks and make sure that the end product is not contaminated. Um, good manufacturing practices, good handling practices, and good agricultural practices um, are, are things to be observed and FDA controls to, to, to limit this in place. Uh, general safety and sanitation standards that are industry-wide, uh, but knowing, kind of doing a self-assessment of knowing what laws might apply to you, and it's going to very much differ based on what food you're working with and the characteristics of that food and its risk profile. Uh, what are the food's responses to how you handle it? Uh, what are you doing with it? Where are you selling it? And how is it being used? That's also going to control that. And how do you manage the risk associated with it? And these are all... Um, part of the inquiry you need to look at to address the legal issues and the liability examination associated with food. And so the question is, is why, why are we focusing on the foodborne illness part of it? Um, a large part of it is the fact that it does affect public health and we have better detection systems now than we did 50 years ago. Um, something called PulseNet is a greater, uh, a tool that allows kind of ground level research to be gathered and, and different data so that we can see who's who's breaking out with what, uh, how these outbreaks might be uh, these outbreaks might be related to one another. If is there some sort of larger scheme going on uh, with this? Uh, we also know that we have an aging population that's more vulnerable to this because of immunosuppression. Um, people are eating more fresh produce because of uh, different safety uh, or not safety uh, different uh, public health conscious concerns. Um, we have more immune compromised citizens because of different autoimmune things popping up in our in our healthcare, uh, more imported produce to achieve your round availability so you can get that food out of season uh, but with greater distance also comes a greater uh, opportunity for these uh, these organisms to take flight um, the loss of immunity going forward again getting back to that older population uh, consumer preferences ready to eat bagged uh, but there's no preservation and climate change also uh, is ca can cause a different uh, breeding ground for certain things like this to happen. So looking at who's most at risk, uh, cancer patients are 53% more likely to die from some uh, adenovirus infection while healthy individuals rarely succumb to this. 
uh, children under five years of age, uh, diabetes patients, HIV AIDS patients, older adults, autoimmune pregnant women, these are most susceptible because they already have, their immune system's already, you know, compromised due to the treatment of some condition or their immune system's already fighting some other uh, sort of health condition. So kind of having that, um, that foodborne illness associated with that is, is the, is a kind of can be that one, two punch that might hit them a little bit harder than the rest of us. So pulse net is the, is the thing that I was talking about for us to kind of, uh, detect this and it's a national laboratory network that connects foodborne illness cases to detect outbreaks and it uses dna fingerprinting or patterns of bacteria making you sick uh, to detect thousands of local and multi-state outbreaks uh, since this began in 96 it has improved our food safety through detecting outbreaks early it allows uh, investigators to find the source alert the public sooner identify the gaps in our food safety systems that would not otherwise be uh, recognized and there's also a similar uh, PulseNet for PulseNet International uh, so that this can be detected globally. There are 83 labs in the U.S. for this, but there's also 83 countries in PulseNet International. Um, we've done some previous segments on microbiological issues, um, and those, uh, those kind of microbiological risk can be uh, detailed more in some of our earlier trainings that are available on our YouTube channel. But... Kind of getting to how to structure your business and avoid kind of liability uh, in ways that might not be um, that might not that might put you at a greater risk. Um, it's important to know that how food safety is regulated, and it's a governmental function, and that we uh, have the health, safety, and welfare responsibilities of a government to its citizens. Um, the food industry and its food producers are responsible for producing safe food and the government agencies are responsible for setting those safety standards and making sure those are met. Um, inspections at import and export, uh, risk assessment and tracking. There are multiple federal agencies involved in food safety. The USDA, responsible for meat, uh, non-game meat, uh, poultry and certain egg products. And basically a good way to think about this is anything that's not meat and falls into certain uh, egg products, uh, the FDA is largely responsible for other than that. So foods other than meat and drugs uh, for medical devices, for animal feed and drugs, cosmetics, radiation emitting devices, bottled water, food additives, baby formula. And the FDA is a part of the Department of Health and Human Services. So FDA is largely involved in that animal aspect and everything else falls under FDA jurisdiction. It's kind of how I generally remember it myself. And the Food and Drug Administration, uh, again, kind of examines those things uh, and egg products, uh, certain different medical devices, biologics. Um, the USDA uh, regulates the meat, uh, meat, poultry, and egg products under the Food Safety Inspection Service. And the Center for Disease Control kind of is that research arm that gathers uh, the, the data on foodborne illness outbreaks and investigates the outbreaks and controls them, monitors uh, for prevention, and conducts the epidemiology and environmental health aspects. But at a local level, you see uh, tribes and states implementing this uh, through tribal and state departments of health for their jurisdictions. Beyond the USDA and FDA, we also have some other agencies with degree of responsibility. Uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, is responsible for fish, shellfish, and fishery products. EPA is responsible for drinking water and pesticides. Um, alcohol, tobacco, tax, and trade is responsible for agricultural production, or excuse me, ag alcohol production. Um, Federal Trade Commission, the truth in advertising on consumer products, including food. CDC, again, fo uh, follows the links between the illnesses and people and the food safety systems. Uh, and U.S. Customs and Border Protection, CBP, uh, entering and exiting food. But the U.S. court system has heard and decided cases on related to food safety since the earlier days of our government and throughout all levels of our court systems. So that's important to know that that's always been kind of lurking in the background and will always be there regardless of, of the way the political winds blow. There are a great series of laws here that pertain to food safety. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these because um, the link will be provided in your PowerPoint. Um, but just know that everything that we've talked about is authorized under some statute that Congress has enacted. But these are not um, 
comprehensive in themselves because you also have state laws that can impose higher standards as well as tribal laws. Um, and there's also different rules related to trademark packaging and labeling, uh, environmental policy, and so forth. Um, the ones listed here, but you also have regulation of food sanitation, meat and poultry, uh, imports and exports, food standards, the regulation of genetically modified organisms, food irradiation. So not only do you have these statutes that we've talked about, um, the larger two that you see are the Food, Drugs, and Cosmetics Act and the Food Safety Modernization Act, but you also have regulatory definitions that implement those, those, uh, those different laws in place. Um, you see regulation of pesticides in foods as an EPA function. Nutrition labeling and dietary standards are USDA and FDA functioning. Uh, regulation of food advertising can fall under both um, some sort of FDA, uh, FTC partnership, uh, depending on how it's done. Uh, toxicological principles for safety of food kind of goes back to the pesticide regulation as an EPA function uh, that's kind of shared with FDA. Um, risk assessment for in food and risk association with food. Uh, food Additives Bioterrorism Act of 2002 uh, was enacted um, to in case there would have been a, a bioterrorism outbreak with our food and making sure that plant sanitation uh, techniques are also regulated is a function of our government. Uh, we have audit systems that are taken into place for industry a lot of times so it's that private regulation. Uh, international food regulation and food national regulatory agencies come. Uh, we audit foreign food supplies that we interpret and they audit ours so that we have that reciprocal arrangement. Um, dietary supplements fall under a different kind of regulatory scheme. Um, biotechnology, uh, we have state and tribal regulation and enforcement of these laws. Uh, private recalls that are done and there's some uh, mandatory recall authority under the uh, Food Safety Modernization Act. But you also see um, individual private actors enforcing civil and criminal lawsuits too. Uh, so even donated food, uh, something here is to be noted as uh, exposed to legal liability. Um, the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act of 1996 provided um, a, a degree of uh, a, kind of a Good Samaritan liability law for those who donate food to others. Um, applies to the donation of apparently wholesome food and apparently fit grocery product, um, meaning that if you donate this food um, and you and, and it appeared wholesome and it was it like it was fit for a grocery product, um, you cannot be held liable unless it's a case of gross negligence, which meant that you had some sort of voluntary and conscious act or you voluntarily and consciously knew there was something wrong with it and that you could have maybe done a little bit better. Uh, and that it was harmful to another, but instead you went ahead and just kind of rolled the dice and gave it to to, to the food uh, donation. Um, if that if the degree of that risk is grossly disproportionate, um, then that could be gross negligence, and also intentional misconduct. If you knew it was uh, some sort of contaminated food and you donated it just to get rid of it, that obviously can come back on you as well. Um, in the 2014 Farm Bill, Congress authorized the donation of traditional foods to public settings in Indian country, uh, recognizing protection from liability for such donations, but indicated that relevant food safety laws must be complied with. Um, there's some more information here at the link below. Uh, but back to the general liability discussion. Uh, when food harm is caused, an investigation may be undertaken by the, by the authorities. Um, a lawsuit is filed. Um, then you have a discovery of facts, which is kind of investigating the facts. Um, and that kind of happens in civil litigation to figure out what happened. But in really bad cases, um, there are criminal um, matters being held open. Um, the purpose of administrative investigations or discovery is to find kind of the source of the problem, looking at the chain of custody or the chain of evidence to figure out where the, the contamination might have occurred and who really is at fault in that. Um, recalls can occur, lawsuits can occur based off of whatever comes up with all these findings. Um, finding the source um, normally results from you know unsanitary conditions, problems in, in the food chain, uh, storage, processing, handling, harvesting, contamination uh, of or at the food source, uh, contamination somewhere along the chain, maybe unhandling at some point or unclean food handling. Uh, most foodborne illness can be traced to these sources, which are generally preventable or avoidable. So following that chain of evidence is scientifically easier now with proper record keeping and making it logistically easier to pull bad foods out of the chain. 
Um, that's that's kind of a good development with our technology we've seen. But liability in the U.S. Um, is held to a form of strict liability. And what this means is you didn't have to have some intent to harm somebody by putting just by strictly putting it out there in the stream of commerce and it causes harm. You are liable just for the fact of that you put it out there, you, you, whether you intended it to be harmful or not. Um, those harm don't have to provide the exact cause of the problem, only that there was a problem of some type and that you were involved in the, to the chain leading to them. Uh, discovery folks focuses kind of on linking those chains together. It then becomes apparent. It becomes your problem to prove that you are not the source of of the of the problem going forward. So the burden of proof is what we call that. In the U.S., if you're injured as a result uh, of foodborne illness, and do you could do nothing, you can let administrative agencies take action, or you could privately enforce that um, in court uh, for compensation. Uh, usually, a lawsuit will allege that someone is legally liable for harming you. Um, there's an excellent resource on this put out by the Public Law Center if you want to know more about this by clicking the link in the PowerPoints that will be distributed later. Um, if, if it's egregious enough, criminal liability can be pursued uh, under federal authorities to hold someone liable for harm to society. Uh, actions opposing criminal liability most, most also occur. Uh, historically, it was a bit unusual, but we're seeing a trend in that going uh, another direction. Uh, to prove some liability for someone's, for someone's injuries, you have to prove that they had some sort of legal responsibility to, to protect from harm, that they failed to protect somehow, that, that, that the injury was resulting to them and that it was reasonably foreseeable that someone would get harmed. Um, but that that's kind of the common law way of preven, per showing that injury. Uh, some jurisdictions also limit that by statute in their own code, so they might modify the common law there a little bit. Um, product liability suits, um, food lawsuits fall into these product liability categories. Uh, the el there's different elements of the claim you have to establish. That the product was in a defective condition and it was unreasonably dangerous for its intended use. So if the food had salmonella or there was a failure to warn that the product contained a peanut, you know, a lot of people have peanut allergies these days. Uh, the defect existed when it left the source. So whoever put it out there in that stream of commerce, the farmer, the warehouse, the truck, um, and the product must have been the proximate cause of the injury. Um, there's different, uh, there's different uh, resources that you can see here that kind of detail more about proximate cause. It's a very tricky legal doctrine that I won't belabor here, but just know that if, if the injury is um, kind of too far attenuated from uh, from the, the initial uh, cause, then sometimes the law will cut off liability uh, under that proximate cause doctrine. Uh, from 2000 to 2011, we had 320 uh, publicly re recorded foodborne illness settlements and verdicts in the United States, and there's more information on these, uh, these sources here below on that. And even when there's not a strict liability problem, you could still be held uh, responsible for a violation of warranties in the food. And when foods are placed in the commerce, warranties follow these. Uh, you know, express could be written or said to you verbally or implied warranties. Or these are the two categories of warranties under the law. And an express warranty is when the seller somehow indicates to you that it was uh, of a certain caliber, uh, either a tight quality, quantity, and free from defects. Uh, these can happen when writings about the goods are exchanged. Um, Certain assurances about quality, you know, quote, meets all food safety standards, all natural, is a GMO, et cetera. Those are different warranty claims because they express that they are of that caliber of food. So if it doesn't reach to that level, then that, that could be a breach of warranty claim. But also know that it doesn't just mean what's written down. If, you're, if you were told something at the point of purchase, that's also an express warranty because that person is speaking on behalf of the, of the entity that sold it to you. Uh, implied warranties are a little bit trickier. Um, courts can imply warranties when they're not stated, uh, but usually these come in two two flavors, the implied warranty of merchantability and the implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose. And the implied warranty of merchantability that the product is going to work as, as claimed, largely it's that this product meets an industry standards of fitting the purpose of what it's normally used for, um, that it meets the specifications on the package label, uniform as to quality and quantity within the parameters for difference. 
Um, fitness for a particular purpose is pretty simple. If it wasn't fit to eat, what is the source of its unfitness for consumption? Um, some questions to ask here is, did the business take reasonable care to ensure fitness and safety of, of merchantability? Uh, implied warranties don't normally cover ordinary wear and tear and proper maintenance or failure to follow instructions. Uh, it doesn't cover every type of failure to the product, and generally there is no specific duration on a warranty, but these are these uh, these different warranties can be limited by statute or altered by statute um, according to the different um, tribes or states at, at issue there. Uh, not all states have adopted sections of the Uniform Commercial Code, uh, which is a, is a, a model law that was drafted uh, by the American Law Institute, and a lot of states have adopted it um, to, to a, so that the law is kind of consistent from state to state and across jurisdictions to make transactions and conducting business easier across state lines. Uh, but there are differences, um, just as there are differences regarding food safety and sanitation, and there are differences in tribal laws. Um, differences in tribal state and local laws there are also different statutes of limitations from state to state and tribe to tribe so it's just really important to, to check your your local jurisdictions and everywhere that you're trying to deal with uh, in terms of uh, dealing in, in commerce with food production and sales um, you can disclaim uh, certain uh, pro certain product uh, liabilities uh, warranty li well, excuse me warranties associated with uh, li liabilities associated with a warranty. Um, sellers can do that if you uh, modify that, but in order to do so, you have to be uh, to, to provide some sort of documentation in, at the sale, and there must be some sort of conspicuous, you know, it must be clear that you're disclaiming this warranty. In some cases, UCC requires specific language in order to disclaim warranties. Uh, uh, mer merchantability and fitness for a particular purchase requires very specific language. And a lot of times you'll find that in you know a sales contract or some sort of fine print associated with the with the transaction itself. Uh, again, regulations enter the picture uh, aside from proving some sort of legal liability through the court system. Uh, federal food laws have very specific requirements or standards that must be met, containing no harmful consumption, that they are fit for human consumption. Uh, make sure that they do not contain filthy diseased or animal substances are not manufactured or produced in an unsanitary way and are protected while on the business premises and while in transit um, some states localities and tribes have different laws that impose different language um, different laws also can uh, speak to donated food in these jurisdictions and there may be um, exemptions from liability or limited exemptions from liability from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and it's important to, to to maintain a certain level of awareness of things kind of going forward uh, in order to uh, to deal with your business in, in these regards, managing your risk through knowing what's out there in terms of what regulations you're dealing with and trying to limit your liability based on the risks that you've identified and managing your exposure to those risks, uh, examining your practices and relationships to know if you could be doing better in providing a safer product, you might find a risk that you might need to address in a certain way on your operation, and also managing the relationships of where those exist. Um, getting and keeping insurance and reading your policies in case there is a foodborne illness outbreak. Um, expecting higher levels of standards from everyone you're in business with because they ultimately impact your actions and your liability. Uh, maintaining the proper records of you know, cleaning your equipment, um, how you've disposed of an unhealthy product. Having uh, plans, including a food safety plan, and keeping up to date on regulations and going to training. Uh, one training that is required, again, for growers over that $25,000 mark under the Food Safety Modernization Act is to go through training uh, for produce safety rule compliance. Uh, our office does a series of those for Indian country. Uh, we have a cooperative agreement with FDA that was just extended for a fourth year. Uh, so please reach out to us if you're a grower that falls into this category with an Indian country and would like to schedule a training. Um, there's some additional important steps here. Determining the standards applicable to you at every level from tribal to federal. Determine what per permits are required or if compliance with regulations is required to meet. Require that each relationship you determine has a written contract or an agreement has mutual responsibilities. Uh, determining whether a business entity type that makes sense for you and your activity, but these don't entirely protect you. Um, they might protect your personal liability, but not your business liability. Uh, we did a, a training on this a while back that's available on our YouTube channel for business entity overview if you want to look up more on those. Um, records must be up to date, thorough, and properly detailed. Um, 
you want clean uh, st sanitary and safety standards should be your top priority. And also training any and all employees and volunteers that work with you. A lot of people forget about the, volu the volunteer part, but they just they present just as much of a risk to your operation too because they're handling things that you're putting into the stream of commerce. So keeping that in mind. Uh, back to general legal principles, you are legally liable for the safety of your product, and if someone is harmed, you can be you can be held responsible, uh, including your personal assets and your farm in jeopardy if you're not properly protected there. Um, this is an issue in general food safety liability and is separate from your responsibilities to understand and comply with, with laws such as FSMA, but there may be general insurance policies that you can find and buy to cover your operation. Uh, an example here is FLIP, Food Liability Insurance Program, uh, more available on their website uh, for food vendors, caterers, everyone listed here, but it doesn't cover uh, certain things like commercial farming operations, companies not in comply with food safety regulations. So you'd have to see what your if your entity is covered or are those with gross annual receipts under 200,000. So it's more of a large scale uh, our insurance. Um, a special note on allergens. Um, these eight major ones listed below account for over 90% of food allergies listed in the United States. And there's certain labeling required under federal law and it must be declared in any processed food. Allergens can be life-threatening to those who suffer. And examples of a control plan. Product design and development, segregation of foods during receiving, storage, handling, and processing. Um, supplier control program for food ingredients and labels. Prevention from cross con contact during processing. Uh, product label review uh, and label packaging usage and control. Validated allergen cleaning program. Uh, staff training and education in allergen precautionary labeling. Uh, and it's important to know that training is the thing that you need to do to keep up on most um, uh, up to date on laws and regulations. Uh, again, grower trainings for FISMA are a great place to start. And our organization is uh, the Native Outreach Training Technical Assistance and Education Organization for FISMA compliance under FDA. And we're in the process of trying to schedule grower trainings for 2019 and the rest of 2020. Uh, in many cases, the answers may not exist to those questions, but we can try to walk you through what we do know uh, as, as these laws are still being developed. And we could still provide grower training so that you understand uh, what these new requirements might be even if you are exempt because what's going to happen um, a lot of times is this becomes the federal standard but a lot of times industry may move in the direction of adopting the federal standard so it is a good a good thing to know going forward and at this time if you guys have any questions i will open the floor for for a few moments here um, and i will address those just type them in the in the comment box uh, on your screen and i will do my best and if you don't have any or you think of any later at another time where you guys just have some issue that you can't untangle. Uh, that's what we're here for. Um, so please uh, take down my contact information or that of any of our team. Visit our website, um, indigenousfoodandag.com, and we have a lot of resources available there and on our food safety website, uh, nativefoodsafety.org. Um, would be a great place to start. Again, here is my contact information, and I'm not seeing any questions at this time. Uh, so. I would like to thank you guys.